In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, everywhere present and filling all things. Treasure of blessing and giver of life, come and dwell within us. Masters of all stain and save our souls, so gracious one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, continue with our second talk on the fatherhood, and again, based on the virtues from the uh, apostolic letter, Patris Corde, with a father's heart by Pope Francis. I'd like to talk on the role of a tender and loving father. And uh, in this second point of this uh, apostolic letter, Pope Francis says, and I quote, Joseph saw Jesus grow daily in wisdom and in years, and in divine and human favor. As the Lord had done with Israel, so Joseph did with Jesus. He taught him to walk, taking him by the hand. He was for him like a father who raises an infant to his cheeks, bending down to him and feeding him. In Joseph, Jesus saw the tender love of God. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. In the synagogue, during the praying of the Psalms, Joseph would surely have heard again and again that the God of Israel is a God of tender love, who is good to all, whose compassion is over all that he has made. Then, uh, from the very last paragraph of the second point, it says, even though Joseph's fears, even through Joseph's fears, God will, his history and his plan were at work. Joseph then teaches us that faith in God includes believing that he can work even through our fears, our frailties and our weaknesses. He also teaches us that amid the tempest of life, we must never be afraid to let the Lord steer our course. At times we want to be in complete control, yet God always sees the bigger picture. We want to be in control. I recall when uh, we were expecting our first child, and that's what we were talking about. Last time, that you know, what is the role of the father during the pregnancy? And now, what is the role of the father when once the child is here? Again, as a, as a father, uh, I had a hard time to find my role. And perhaps you dads out there, what is there for us to do, right? First, first month, first couple of months, first three months, first six months. And uh, I'll have to tell you also that when Miriam started working and, and she was at one of the daycares later on, there was something shocking to me as I realized that many of the mothers, after six weeks, they go back to work. And as she was uh, teaching at the daycare, as she was, she was taking care of the children, and there was a daycare where you could put your child right at, at, after six weeks, after the birth. And she had those children, she was talking to me and she says, Mark, I have, a, I have a kid that is about a year and a half. Mom drops her off at six in the morning and she comes and picks her up at seven at night. And I, I thought like, oh my dear Lord, you know, what, what is this? It, uh, what is this child going to be when he or she grows up, right? Because we can think that, well, this is the modern world, that this is United States. You either, you, you, you either like it or go somewhere else, right? Go to Canada, go to Mexico, go back to Europe, go wherever you don't like it. But it's not about liking the fact that uh, uh, you have to agree with the idea or questioning the, the fact that why children after six weeks and, and uh, uh, mothers, right? if it's a single mother, you understand it, but if, you know, uh, 
if father is working, right, why do we put these children uh, to the facilities, especially like in that particular uh, reason, a little child, year and a half, constantly trying to find her mother. And that's what they do, you know, these first months. And again, as, as a father, there's much, not, not much to do. Unless you are like a father-mom sort of thing, like kid will naturally first six months after the birth, kid will naturally go to the mother. That's just that instinct that uh, that we men have a problem to cope with because for the last nine months the kid was uh, with the mother, the kid ate with mother ate. Uh, kid drank what mother drank. Mm. He had, you know, for instance, Holy Communion, right? Mom goes to Holy Communion. The kid receives that Holy Communion. And, and so on. And uh, has that feeling, right? And then kid is being born. And I, I recall when we had Caroline, uh, uh, my mother-in-law came over from Europe. And you could see that all of a sudden, it's just between Miriam and my mother-in-law. You're my mother in law. And, and all of a sudden, you found yourself like, well, what's my role here? What, what am I supposed to do? Right? And, I, and I even promised you, know, like, I, I'm going to be waking up with you. Uh, whenever you nurse, you know, I'll be there for you. You know, like all these big words and big promises. And it lasted about two nights. And I couldn't keep up because all of a sudden, you realize as a father that every four hours you need to wake up. Right? If you make that promise, right? That, oh, yeah, I'll be there for you. Uh, so that was the first mistake that, that I did, right? Promising what I cannot keep up with. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you're at the point of like, okay, so it's between her and my mother-in-law. And if my mother-in-law could not make it, I guess, well, in our situation, because uh, our parents at that time and grandparents, everybody, everybody from Europe, they, they were 6,000 miles away, or whatever it is, 5,000 miles. So you cannot just come every weekend, you know, to visit them, get some break, or something like that. So that was her role, and, and you could see, like, first six months, that just, you have almost, like, nothing to do as a father. Maybe you hold a child for a little bit, and, and maybe I change the diaper now and then if, if you want to, but this is predominantly all mom trying to do all that. You're still that protective mood uh, or mode uh, in that, you know, uh, even if you, if you take a picture, I, I recall taking pictures with a photographer one day, and the way the woman holds the child and the way the man holds the child is a totally <coughs> different way of, of holding the kid, because that's that ten tenderness of the mother. I mean, we're just rough. We, we take that kid like a, like a cinder block or something. I'm not trying to make a fun of it, but that's that's how we are. And uh, things will start shifting after uh, after six months. Yeah, you realize that yeah, you cannot nurse this kid, and, and but after six months, it's proven, and even uh, uh, scientifically, that kids start realizing their sexualities. Uh, all of a sudden, they start realizing that the boy is a boy and the girl is a girl. And especially when you have, like, I don't know if you have twins, right? and you have a girl and a boy. And all of a sudden, you see that the boy will be going more towards cars and, and tools and something rough. And the girl is more like, you know, leaning towards like softer things and crawling towards that. And at about one year, now you're coming to the point that, and that's where the father roles comes very handy, right? Because at one year, year and a half, uh, they start realizing that when there is uh, anger in mom, 
they start realizing that there is a second person all of a sudden. That's who guess who that is? It's the father. So when the kid, whether that's a boy or a girl, uh, goes from the tenderness, the, the beautiful life, and, and all of a sudden gets mad. So this little girl goes to the little dad. You know, that, that's where that term comes from, right? That, that she has wrapped you around her pinky, right? Her, 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 she got you, right? Like you would promise her anything, especially the first little girl, right? And she needs that. If she's whatever, for whatever reason, very mad and mom, but, but she'll forget soon, but she needs somebody to go to at that point. And that's the father. And then she'll cry, she'll be on, on your chest, and you know, uh, she'll cuddle. You know, and that, they'll cuddle more than just at the, after first year, but and then she'll go back to mom. Now imagine that that you don't have that, or, or that uh, you are trying to escape from the family, or, or how many dads are there that after second or third child, they just leave the family because they can't anymore. Because all of a sudden, they're not in the control. And it's tough, because it's not about them. It's, it's about this little teeny tiny creature that's there. And you are exhausted and you are full of fear and you are nervous and you don't know what to expect. I recall that uh, Caroline was about seven months old, seven or eight months old, and all of a sudden Miriam started fainting, like, you know, uh, lightheaded and boom, you know, on the, on the bed or, or sit down, or she had to sit down. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. And that was the time when uh, my mother-in-law left back for Europe. Uh, there was, I mean, there were some parishioners around, but they couldn't help you 24 seven. Right? So we started being concerned, like what's going on with Miriam, right? So we went to the Cleveland Clinic. We went all kinds of CAT scans, all kinds of stress tests, all, all kinds of like other tests. And then uh, we went, uh, it, was, it was at the Middleburg Heights, uh, one of the doctors, he, he was from Germany, actually, and he was a heart specialist working for a Cleveland clinic, but also he worked at the, at the, the hospital at uh, Middleburg Heights. And when he did some evaluations, look at some, he looked at some testing uh, from stress tests and all, and then he says, he says something like this, you know what is the problem? And I never forget that, that day and that moment when he told us that, says, your problem uh, and, and what's causing your, your stress and fainting and, and exhaustion and all is this uh, two feet tall creature next to you. It's a little child. Because all of a sudden, you know, everything is just spinning around her. And we took everything so seriously and, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And as a father, you were running around and you were doing groceries and you were still dealing with moods and trying to find your role. And, and you're still realizing it's not about you. But all of a sudden, right, you get it because you're tired for a reason. And you're tired because this little child. And you do try to do everything for her. And then when second child comes, the same thing. But you already know some tricks. When, when uh, Elias was born, Caroline was about three and a half years old, or somewhere, but three years old. So with Caroline, with our first child, it was sort of everything was, you know, like even like a binky, you know, or a pacifier. Oh, put it in the boiled water, right, because it went on the floor or, or fell on the floor. Uh, everything was serious. We were reading books, we were reading all kinds of uh, material about you know how to raise kids with Elias with the second child it kind of like you know eased up and when Marco was born our third child Caroline was about six Elias three and, and he was born uh, and then later on when, when he could crawl and he would crawl up to the uh, toilet bowl and we found
found him one time brushing his teeth in the toilet bowl, cleaning the, the, the toothbrush in the toilet bowl, I kind of putting it back to his mouth. And I recall, like, we just said, I, that's enough. Like, I, we're just tired of it. And, and reaching point where Elias would be, uh, our second child would be literally dropping, you know, some, uh, some poop. And, and Marco would follow and he would pick up and eat it. Because it was, you know, it was brown, it was like little, uh, you know, uh, little pieces. And then he thought it's the chocolate or something. And you're like so stressed out and scared to death, like, what are we going to do? All right, so now, Miram comes to me and what do you do? And I don't know what you do. I, you know, he has uh, some poop in his mouth, so I, I don't know, clean it some. Didn't we realize that you have to call uh, a number that's called like a poison? On a circle, whatever, whatever. What, what is that called? Poison control. Poison control. Did you call them and, and they tell you what happened? I mean, you tell them what happened and they tell you what to do. But this stress that you have to go through as, as a father, and through this stress, try to find the tenderness and love for this child. Because all of a sudden, you realize that no matter what you do, They'll follow you. Whether they crawl or whether they know how to walk. Right? And, and I recall when we were, we, we couldn't wait when she starts to talk and walk. And when she started doing it, then we couldn't wait. And we were saying, like, oh my God, we, we, we wish for it. And now we're just saying that we just wish that she would sit down and shut her mouth. <laughs> that's, that's how it is. You know. And where to find this tenderness and love? That all of a sudden you realize that that you are in the bathroom trying to lift up your feet while you're sitting in the bathroom so your child doesn't go underneath the door and say, Are you still there? Because you're so tired of them. You you reach the point as a father, as a mother, that I, I recall like leaving for either basement or a garage or going outside. I was literally looking for excuses to do something outside because I was so tired of being with kids already. Or when you're on a phone call, they're quiet playing as a little kid and then you pick up the phone, the, the, that second they're right next to you. Why? Because all of a sudden they sense that you pay attention to somebody else. And they want your attention. And that's what they'll do. They'll follow you like a little ducks in the house. And sometimes you wish that you had like a little closet somewhere where nobody finds you as a father. Right? Perhaps not as a mother because she has always more love for them and, and patience than, than fathers do. But I want to tell you something. That... How many times you wanted to get a good sleep in those first years when they were growing, like first year, second, third year. Sometimes they'll do it even now. The youngest is seven. That they want, they want to sleep between you. It's like mom and dad, and all of a sudden, like, they'll crawl into bed. And they'll kick you in, in, the, in, the, in the back and in the neck and in all kinds of positions. And, and, uh, you're just not happy with it, but you love them. You love you. You're showing that love as a father. And I read this beautiful uh, explanation about like the icon of the Holy Trinity, where you don't have these three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right, outlined and, and saying like only in those outlines, in those persons. Only there is God. No. That icon of the Trinity, you need to think about between the space. Between the space between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that space with, is also filled with God. And then, if you look at it and be glad, and take it that way, that when your child 
wants to come between you, between your mom and dad in a bed, or wants to be between you when you're talking, serious talk, and then they come in the middle and they listen. Enjoy those moments. Because that is when they're feeling the most love. That you are there for them as a parent, as a father. That they see you not running away. That they see you not trying to get rid of them. Just, just go away. No. That's when they need you the most in those years. And then they need to vent too. I mean, we adults, we need to vent as well. But they need, and if they don't find mom, then they'll go to dad, and vice versa. Now imagine if there is no father, this girl or boy will go only to one of the parents. If we, you know, if it's mom, only to mom. But this little girl or boy doesn't want to disappoint the mother as well. So many times they won't vent. And they'll be holding that anger within them. And that's where a lot of defects are starting. And that's where a lot of these uh, different identities are coming later on in years. Like, I, I feel like this, and I, I feel like that, and I feel like, a, you know, I don't feel like a boy anymore. I feel like a girl. You know, and, and I feel like I have rights for everything. And that, that comes from not enough love from the parents. Especially when they need to vent and there's only one person and they, they can't do that or they don't want to disappoint mom all the time. So they're holding it or dad on the other side if there's only a single dad. They don't want to disappoint. And that's where all the troubles are starting. I have only a couple more minutes to, to talk. Uh, Perhaps I'll end up with a quote from St. John Chrysostom when he said, grab your child by a hand and bring him to church. That's what St. Joseph did when he took Jesus to synagogue. Jesus, uh, Jesus traveled with his parents a lot, especially in the first years. Uh, you know the story of flying to, uh, fleeing to Egypt, then later on coming back. They were pretty much migrants or immigrants, you know, being in a, in a foreign land. Uh, Jesus was shown a lot of love by his mom and, and uh, Joseph. And it was very important for his uh, later development. And, and the same thing is with us. So those very first years, and especially first months, even though we don't see ourselves as fathers, as, as very important, we play a very important role especially those first couple, three years. Uh, maybe not first months, uh, not first six months, but then we step into the picture big time and they'll be noticeable. So we need to be there for them if possible. Yes, we're full of fear. Uh, we're scared to death many times, but as as it says here in this Patris Cordi, at times we want to be in complete control, yet God always sees the bigger picture. And that's how we need to look at it. And if it's not going our way, it's okay. Because God sees the bigger picture in all the situations. So that's all for today. We're going to continue with uh, further development of, of the child and how the father's role is important. Uh, in that matter, so please watch us. You can again always log on to pharma.org or FRK Facebook. Uh, this is again being recorded, so you can watch it anytime on uh, social media. And uh, I'll be seeing you soon. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ.